<laughs> wow, look, a magical thing. The big business is ruining America. Yep, he's totally right. What? It's Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show. Starring Matt. Today's episode, Fateful Findings, Part 1. Hello Internet, I'm Matt, and this is Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show. You know, in the bad movie world, it's hard to catch an up-and-comer. But oh glorious day did I ever. Hey Matt! Yes? Where do you find this shit? I'm glad you asked. I was visiting my friend James in Austin, the hipster capital of Texas. Also the political capital of Texas. <laughs> we were renting, yes, renting, some nonsense like for your height only. And of course the clerk recognizes that we are bad movie connoisseurs and recommends some little known movie called Fateful Findings. Of course since then, your movie sucks did a review of it, so it's a little more mainstream. But there's definitely still stuff left to mention. But enough about how I found it, let's talk about how it got made. Neil Breen is the new Ed Wood. He's made four movies and they are all gloriously bad. I mean, I haven't actually seen his newest one, but I doubt you can come back from this nonsense. And if Neil Breen is Ed Wood, Fateful Findings is his plan nine. Although it definitely has more in common with The Room. The film was released in 2013 and features no one of particular importance and is so packed full of good stuff that I just want to get on with the review. So without further ado, I present... Fateful Findings. Rip off Harry Potter music. Breen sure does know how to set tone. Then we see a storage facility with a giant book, and given Breen's ego, I'm sure that was the first draft of this script. We see two kids messing around in the wo uh, desert. Desert. They were in the desert. Look at this. That skull looks like he's trying to figure out what's going on as much as the rest of us. Look, Leah. A mushroom. Yes, it is. Wait, nope. It's a bag. With a ghost inside. And a D&D tie? No, wait, I bet it's the sixth Infinity Stone, tying this into the Marvel movies. You can't leave the box empty. It's bad luck. I'm not afraid. Kids hardcore. Luckily, there's just some rubies lying around, so they fill it with that. It's a magical day. Unlike yesterday, where nothing happened. But it looks like Leah, the girl, is moving out of town, and she has to say goodbye to her friend Dylan. But it's okay, you don't want to be friends with any douche who wears two watches. Yes, that's the most ridiculous thing about this movie so far. Cut to years later and Dylan is all breened up. Wait, everything looked pretty modern before. It's gotta be at least 20 years later. Is this the distant future? But they all have old phones. This doesn't make any sense. There was a mushroom. And so that concludes my review of the Super Mario Bros. movie. Wait. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Are you on your way home? Okay, great. I haven't even said anything. I don't even think you answered the phone. So a bunch of people go to cross the street, but then suddenly Dylan is alone. But this is a shot at a crosswalk, and he's clearly not at a crosswalk. Are you starting to see why this is a two-parter? Then... <laughs> and if that's not enough, these extras make it. Call 911! Call 911! Is he dead? Is he dead? It's the Rolls Royce that hit him. I saw it. I'm a witness. Must take one last selfie. So Dylan is hospitalized, but he manages to take his die with him. That way, if he rolls a three or higher, he can cast a healing spell. And by hospital, I mean one of those hospitals with slatted windows and carpet that looks like the inside of someone's home. 
But Dylan wakes up and decides it's time to go home. Wait, they put the oxygen mask on outside the face bandage? No wonder I'm suffocating. Nice dissolve. So Dylan takes off his bandages in the shower and good lord. You shouldn't have been bleeding that much from a low-speed car hit anyway, but you've got a bandage over the worst parts and you've been in the hospital for a few days. This is Tarantino levels of excessive blood. Oh, and hey, now may be a good time to mention that none of the women in this movie wear bras. I guess the costume department just didn't have the budget to buy them? Or Neil Breen is a huge pervert. Who can say, really? Needless to say, in spite of there being no actual nudity, some scenes may be censored because I feel like they're cutting it too close. And if you think anything in a Neil Breen movie is good jacking material, buddy, you got problems. Anyways, while working on his book, Dylan is overcome with pain, causing him to begin his long but consistent genocide of old laptops. Then we're introduced to Jim and Amy, who I'd say are extraneous to the plot, if I knew what the plot was. Can I offer you a drink? No thanks. I am just here to show off side boob. We don't have sex anymore. Do you realize that? Anyway, how is your sex life? My office at the bank is having major problems. My office at the bank? In case you forgot where I work. Be quiet, she'll hear you. Oh. You mean your stepdaughter? Well, maybe she should hear this, so she doesn't make the same mistake. Of marrying me. And here's where I tell you it was a hilarious prank and I edited all that footage in from a porno. Except I'm not joking. That's in the movie. Dylan asks for his pills, but his wife Emily slips a few. A plot point that will come in and out of relevance at random. I don't need these. Breen, I've seen your movies. You absolutely do. No more. No more. Don't do that. No. Can you feel the drama? Then Dylan clutches his magic stone and gets taken to a room made of trash bags. Symbolizing that Neil Breen is garbage. You're still not well. Did you take your meds? I don't even think that was scripted. I think she was actually asking Neil Breen that. Especially since her character literally stood by and watched as he dumped them in the toilet. So Dylan goes to see his psychotherapist and sits as far away as possible to spout random nonsense. I'm feeling less stable. And then he leaves, because Breen has more laptops to destroy. Haha, -ha, score one for laptops. Oh, damn it. But Jim and Amy get in a fight over his car and sex. I don't know, stuff Neil Breen thinks normal people argue about. Screw you! That's the idea, baby. So Emily invites Jim, Amy, and their daughter Allie over for dinner. Haha, uh -huh, yep, there's definitely something in this bottle. Uh. And this dialogue. Shakespeare couldn't do it justice. We're glad to visit. I want you to try this new wine. I'd love to try your wine. I still can't believe you're up and around so fast. I'm still sore, but... Feeling much better, thanks. Dinner will be ready soon. I'm hungry. I can't wait for dinner. It seems like it never happened. This goes on for two and a half minutes. What even? Could they only afford bottles and no beer? That's clearly water. But Dylan has work to get done. I'm going to continue hacking into these government systems to see what I can find out. About all this national and international corruption I know is going on. Why are you cutting back to me? You think I can top that? Nah. But the next scene has a topless woman in it. 
I swear, every scene with these two characters feels like we're checking back in on two characters from a porno five years after the porno ended. Then Dylan talks to his therapist, and I think some of the dialogue from the not-having-sex couple got slipped in. Aren't our sessions rewarding anymore? No. Then Dylan and Emily have an argument... Your pill taking for pain relief has gotten out of control. These pills for your moderate to severe plaque psoriasis are really messing with your mind. My job sucks! I don't like the people I work with. Again, was that even scripted? Dylan's rampage against laptops has them so scared they keep typing even when he's not. But it's no use, and the body count rises to five. What a cute couple. I'm sure they'll be together forever. So Dylan goes to see a new psychotherapist, who I guess also has his mushroom magic? And it's sad when even the characters in the film are like, screw this noise, I'm out. Actually, it's magic, but my version somehow makes more sense. Just like Dylan and Emily's relationship. Are you having an affair? That's it, isn't it? You are, aren't you? No, I'm not having an affair. I knew it. There is another girl. Sorry, I'm not quite sure where you're sitting on this couch. No, that is not true. Look at this sorry son of a bitch. He knows he's guilty. So Dylan and Emily have a barbecue, and guess who shows up? The doctor at the hospital. It's nice to see you. I'd like you to meet my fiancé, Tim. I'm introducing Tim, but you can call me doctor from the hospital. And then it happens again. The doctor at the hospital. I'd like you to meet my fiancé, Tim. So... The doctor at the hospital... ...goes for her phone and drops her notebook, which she carried around every day since she was eight, but only ever wrote in once. And time has clearly been better to her, as she looked maybe a year older than Dylan at the beginning, but now looks ten to fifteen years younger. Yes, it's sad I have to end our journey so soon, but believe me, if ever there was a movie that deserved it, it was this movie. So until then, I'm Matt, and this is Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show. Is he breathing? Is he okay? Check it out, this is the actual post-it note from the guy who recommended the movie to us. Top notch stuff. History. Hmm? History. History. <laughs> Put this in an archive somewhere. Editing. That. That's gonna be my post-credit sequence. Oh.